You're listening to Dropping Pins, a story-based learning series from the OKS Hunter podcast hosted by Derek Melkor and aimed at helping you hone your whitetail hunting skills. You'll hear the aha moments when known and unknown proven whitetail killers started consistently putting mature bucks on the ground. All right, here we go. This is our first episode uh, with a guest, not just me talking. Uh, we did our intro episode um, just earlier today, and now we're bringing on two guests tonight. These are two buddies of mine that we have had a hunting, pretty much all, hunt all, all species, no matter what, but mo mainly deer-centered. Uh, we've had a little group text going on for a number of years. Um, two really good hunters, uh, local guys to Wisconsin here. So if you're not from Wisconsin, sorry, we're going to saturate some Wisconsin hunting prowess here in the first episode. Um, but I've got my buddy, Corey Gelhausen. Uh, Corey runs Tenacious Hunter, um, which has got a YouTube channel. Go check it out. He's got tons and tons of hunt on there. Really good with the video editing and whatnot. Um, Corey used to be a member of Wisconsin Whitetail Pursuit. They put out a series of uh, DVDs back in the day. Um, really good behind the camera, great photographer, great videographer, and has gotten it done on bear, deer, turkey, you name it, on public land here in Wisconsin. So, Corey, welcome to the show. Dropping pins. How are you doing tonight? Yep. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, this will be fun. We've we've talked for a long time. Last year, we got to shoot the bows together down at Anthony Heller's, um, but it'll be fun to chit-chat some more whitetail tonight. Yeah, did you make it down there this year or no? I did not. Um, that was, I, was I, that I Father's think... Day weekend. Yeah, I, I see. I just couldn't pull it off this year either. Yeah, we got busy, and I don't remember what the heck we had going on, but I think we were planning on going, and then all of a sudden, that week, things just got crazy. I wasn't able to make it either. Yeah, I might um, say we so... had a bunch of Father's Day plans come up, and just, yeah, I couldn't get the time to make the haul down there. He runs a really good shoot. If anybody knows Anthony or has heard of the playground shoot, it's a really nice shoot. It's on his his father's property, their family property. It's it's really cool. It's like 40 bucks. You get your money's worth. You shoot, you eat. It's a good time. Um, the third leg of our tripod here is uh, our good buddy, um, Tim Hinky. Uh, Tim was um, a member of the Hunting Beast for a number of years and helped out in the workshops and did some videography for them. Um, he's got a video on the Hunting Beast channel that um, has accrued some serious fame with 767,000 views. I checked this morning, um, a really cool Iowa public land hunt that Tim did. Jeez, that must be, is that three years ago? Yeah. Yeah. 21 is when, when I got that one. So it's been a while. It's an awesome video. Um, Tim did a really nice job on the whole video, just piecing out like what he was thinking about and how he was attacking a piece of public property. Um, and you've been on a few different out-of-state trips. Did you hit Indiana with the Hunting Beast guys, or what, what state was that? Uh, I I was in camp with when they went to the Michigan Public Land Challenge. Um, mm. I did hunt one night. I just they they weren't really getting on anything big um that they really wanted to shoot but they were getting they were getting on bucks and they're like well tim hey you want to buy a tag i'm like sure so i hunted for a day and i almost actually pulled it off so um so that, that was fun for a day even if in michigan um and then i did uh, the pennsylvania uh public land challenge where uh i actually had a really good good night uh day two i i saw like 15 deer um eight of them were bucks i shot i saw a shooter like a 140 i was like man this is and i don't i think aside from that buck i don't think anybody saw anything bigger than that one so so that was that was that was a really awesome trip even though i wasn't able to seal the deal yeah that's awesome and you've been doing kind of your own thing now uh tim's the producer of first sit productions you've got your youtube channel that's doing really well he's got all kinds of cool scouting videos and did you hit indiana was that this past year is maybe what i'm thinking yeah did you go down to indiana and hunt down there some public yep yeah, my my buddy uh, Josh Talker from before the Echo. He uh, he lives down in Southern Indiana, and um, every every uh, every year a couple guys will go down and, and stay at his house for camp, and um, he kind of just points you in the right direction, you know, the hills, and uh, that's where we went. So uh, that was my first uh, hill country trip to Indiana, and it was it was a lot of fun. Um, the hills whipped me, 
no doubt. They're they're very hard. <laughs> But I got a lot of experience, you know, um, what to expect. I got to see uh, the deer movement um, where you would expect it in the hills. So just seeing it for the first time was was really eye opening. Um, and I think I got a good start for next year, too. So or for, for this great, upcoming. Season. Yeah. Getting a little hill country under your belt. And that's kind of what I'd like to just ask you guys real quick before we dive into maybe a story or two that you guys have. But um, Corey, we'll start with you. What what kind of stuff did you kind of come up hunting where you where are you located what kind of terrain is it what are you most comfortable with just so anyone listening who wants to relate to some stories has an idea of kind of what your your background is as far as your deer hunting oh, goes i say i grew up in northern lang lake county and that's that's pretty much all flat land up there i mean there's some small hills but nothing that you would really consider hill country and you know big cedar swamps and uh marshes not really cattail marshes, but just uh, tag alder marshes, stuff like that. And uh, I guess I really don't have a favorite. I mean, wherever I can, you know, find the biggest buck or the best chance at shooting something, that's where I'm headed. You know, I I like the marshes and the swamps because, you know, it seems like the sign's a little easier to read out there. But then again, I think when I hunt hill country, I've done better in hill country, but there's just not a lot of, you know, textbook hill country around here. But, um, yeah, I say wherever I can find the, you know, the nicest buck that I think I got a best chance at, that's where I'm going. It's pretty reasonable. I think that's probably a good way to do it. Um, yeah, I say I, I say I, I really don't have a favorite. Wherever, wherever I can get away from the people and find some decent buck sign that you can read and make a game plan on, that's where I'm going. An opportunist. I love it. Yep. Tim, what about, Tim, what about you? Uh, I was my favorite. <laughs> the whole state. <laughs> no. Um as far as terrain goes, uh I'm like uh same as Corey. I, I grew up in Lincoln, which is just the neighboring uh, county of Lane Lake, and then I uh, hunted in Oneida, which is just north of that. Um just big woods, uh big treks of public land, um, some open hardwoods, um spruce swamps, uh moss swamps, you know, stuff like that tag alders uh so, that, so that's kind of like how i grew up and the terrain i always just ended up because i never i never traveled i never went anywhere so that was just you know you get what you get that's where you are and that's where dad you know points you to and he's that's where you hunt so that's where you learn um but over the years you know hunting with uh the, the hunting beast, you know, and other guys have, you know, learned uh, the, the hill country and uh, egg. And now I'm in central Wisconsin and there's a lot of egg around here and there's a lot of big marsh too. So um, as far as a favorite, um, I don't know if I have a favorite. I, I just, I'm more, more prone to the, the marshes though, just because I've had the most experience with it and uh, probably the best, most success. And, and like Corey alluded to, it's a little easier probably to read the sign um but they're still really hard to kill too oh yeah and with the amount of content like the stuff that everyone's been doing those kind of areas that are easier to read if they have not been found you'd be damn lucky to get in there but most of them have been found and other people find them easy to read also so i think we're all running into the same issues um both of these guys like i said we've got a, a group text message group or messenger and talk deer nearly daily and most of us are fighting it out on public ground and trying to figure that out, except for Corey, he's hunting all that, you know, cushy private land and <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But, uh, I, yeah, that's, say, that's kind I, of, I wish, I wish I could. <laughs> I think I got it right out the back door here, but I say, um, I say, I can't, I can't get no big bucks to show up there. I find the bigger ones on public. So I keep heading back out there. Yeah. And that's the truth, right? I mean, a lot of times that's where they're at. Not always. But uh, in the kind of the theme of what we're doing here, you guys are my first guests on here, but for Dropping Pins, this segment, what we're trying to do is kind of do story-based, helping people who are maybe beginning hunters or kind of stuck in whatever situation they're in, trying to help them step up to the next rung of the ladder and advance their skills a little bit. And we're trying to do that by learning from people who have done really well. Um, both of you are accomplished hunters. You have hunted multiple terrains, multiple states. Um, both of you got some big bucks on the wall. I can see above Tim's head, line of deer there. Corey's got a real impressive trophy room. Um, not that that necessarily makes the hunter, but 
um, what I'd love to hear from you guys today, and I'm not really worried about which one of you starts, so whoever's got something, but what we had talked about beforehand was um, maybe a story, an encounter, a situation, um, whether that was a hunting situation or not, but something that started to make things click a little bit. And even if it was just one aspect of how you hunt now that really opened your eyes and went, holy crap, that's an aha moment. I now have a little bit better bead on what these mature animals are doing, how they're behaving or how they're using terrain. Um, this morning, I just did uh, one of my stories um, that helped me kind of realize the importance of how much pressure we as the hunter are putting on that the animals do what the animals do. We have very little control over that, but as the hunter, we can control our spots and how much scent we're leaving in there and how much we're altering the areas. So I had a spot and uh, I kind of talked about that and you guys kind of know what we talked about before. So whoever would like to lead off, if you got something that was kind of an eye opener, an aha moment, even if it was something small, love to hear whatever you got for us. You want to go, Corey, or you want me to go? I can go first. I mean, you guys know I like my mock scrapes, so I guess I got to throw that out there. The mock scrapes have Hell done yeah. great for me, uh, especially doing inventory. And, you know, that was kind of an aha moment trying to kill that great big buck I was after back from 2018 to 2020 for three years. You know, he was walking onto the public land, but living on private land and had to do something to try and, you know, coax him off the private land on the public where I could shoot him. So I started running mock scrapes and, you know, I was lucky enough to grow up in a hunting family and, you know, learn the woodsmanship early and just using my mock scrapes by reading terrain and where, you know, I thought big bucks should be moving through. You know, there wasn't necessarily any big buck sign there, but getting a mock scrape in there and a camera over it, you know, figuring out where he was going through and the, the mock scrape just helps get the deer in front of the camera. So you can, you know, figure out where he's moving and where he's not moving and what spots to focus on. Did you know about that big deer? Now, Tim and I are familiar with it. We've seen gawked over pictures of this deer. Did you know about him before you had gone in and put mock scrapes in that area or was that the lead off? No idea. I say I was actually hunting another buck that was bigger than him. The first year we had, uh, that I, well, that was the second second year I hunted that piece of public land, and uh, I actually originally started turkey hunting down there. There was, you know, not very many good turkey hunting spots up where we live, so I kept moving farther south in the state. And uh, you know, I always seen decent buck sign in there, but it's quite a drive from the house. It was you know over an hour, and the deer hunting wasn't very good up in the big woods. So you know, I started making the drive down there and running cameras, and got into a onto a different buck that was really nice and was you know trying to find him and ended up stumbled upon this other one and they logged it off that year that you know the second year i got in there and you know when they started logging in there and you know making all the noise that one buck that i was after he kind of vanished and never came back and we found out i think three years later in 2020 he actually got killed the same year as the buck that i was hunting and you know that buck yeah. just re relocated about three miles north and never came back and uh I stayed that big one I was on, I kind of found him by accident, but he stuck around in the area there and, you know, gave me a good, good run there for three years trying to kill him. Before the a uh, little saga, <laughs> before the trail cameras and the, the mock scrapes, did you see any sign that would indicate that a giant was living in that area? There was, there was, uh, and actually it wasn't even, you know, anywhere near the area that we were getting pictures of him. It was, uh, this little, like, piece of flat ground between the swamp and a small set of hills. There was some, it was, uh, I want to say they were balsam trees. I'm pretty sure they were balsam trees or spruce trees, you know, but as big around as my leg and they had just some monster rubs on them. And that buck was only rubbing on them big balsam trees. And to this day, no other bucks touch them, them rubs there. I mean, they're still there and they're, what is that? Probably six years old now, but, uh, yeah, there was, there was some monster rubs in there that tipped me off that there's a big buck living in that area. I've got two questions for you, Corey. Um, the mock scrape thing has really taken off the last few years, very popular way to get camera pictures, but you were kind of running this mock scrape setup that I had not really seen before um, when you started it. So I'd love for you to go in a little bit of detail on how you're setting up your mock scrapes, what you're doing, are you using sense? And then you had talked about great place to throw a mock scrape in front of your camera. I do the same, 
love to throw the mock scrape in front of the camera, get the deer to pose. Are you still hunting over those where your camera is or are those just to get pictures? What is your kind of setup or does it depend on the, the terrain? I mean, I'm definitely hunting over them because usually, you know, I'm so tied up to the private land trying to cut that buck off from where he's bedded that, you know, you got a hunter because that's the only spot. And, uh, you know, years ago as a kid, you know, I, I, I think my uncle bought me, it was like the, the original primetime, primetime bucks VHS tapes. You guys remember those? Oh yeah. Alex Rutledge and, uh, Tom? remember the guy who makes the owl hooting call? Yeah, oh! that was Eddie, Eddie Salter. Yeah, Eddie Salter. But Tom Miranda, he had the the whole mock scrape um, kit. You know, I tried that way back when I was like 12 years old and never had any luck with it. But, you know, back then you just, you know, find a branch in the woods and kick the leaves out and put a bunch of scent on it and hope a deer would use it. And then, uh, you know, I seen all these guys online having success with the hanging the vines. And, you know, that's when I started doing good as, you know, up here where I live, there's there's not really any vines where I grew up hunting, but now that, you know, you get down into the central part of the state, I started finding these vines and I thought, well, I'll try it because the other guys have had success with it. And, you know, just hanging that vine, using some uh, paracord and getting it right. It's almost like trapping. I keep telling people, it's, you know, <laughs> if you're trying to, you know, trap a coyote, you got to put that trap right where that coyote's going to step. You got to hang that mock scrape uh, vine, like right where that deer, it's going to hit him in the face, whether he wants to or not. So, you know, he knows it's there and starts using it. And some of those setups, man, they look a little bit like a gymnastics playground. I see the bears on some of the pictures you've sent <laughs> trying to monkey bar across those damn mock scripts. Not that everybody asks me what kind of scent I use, and I've I've strictly just quit using scent because that's the that's the main issue I have around here. You know, I make a nice a nice mock scrape setup and you put any kind of scent on and the bears show up and ruin it and it's just you know, it's junk. But I see I've gotten good at placement where I get it in the right spot. The deer start using it, and uh, you get all that natural deer scent on there, and that works great. You use a yeah. scent though, Corey. Don't you use like Rockstar or what? What is it? Oh, no. <laughs> Sh sugar free Rockstar. You just got to filter it first. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, Tim, you you dabble with some mock scrape stuff, also, right? Not like Corey does. I mean, like he's the champ. I don't have. Uh, I don't have any good experience with mock scrapes, but I, yeah, I can, I can build them and I can get deer to walk in front of them, but I, I don't uh, spend a lot of time hunting them like Corey does. I just got to ask, there's three of us on here. We know Corey is a sugar-free rock star, me pee guy where he's peeing in his scrape. Tim, are you peeing in your scrape or what are you doing? Yeah, I got me pee, um, but I don't, I, I don't, it's not rock star. Usually it's, it's a Red Bull. <laughs> I'm a, Duncan Midnight Dark coffee. And oh, yeah. That's that real potent, that earthy scent. Yeah, they like that. But uh, yeah. yeah, I guess all three of us, no problem peeing in the scrape. A lot of people, you know, don't ever leave your scent in the woods, but it's been working, working for Corey. It's a good setup. Yeah, right, I remember, remember back in the oh, days when you, always, when you always had to carry the milk jug with you, you know, pee in the milk jug because you didn't want the deer to, you know, smell where you are in the woods and, you know, Thankfully, that's all went away. Wait, we don't, you know, carry on milk jugs full of piss all over the woods. Oh, God. Thank God you guys didn't listen to the OKS Hunter podcast last night. <laughs> Brian Douglas, our buddy from Illinois who shot that great big booner, he had a whole, he's marketing a shit in your saddle setup, double Ziploc bags, wet wipes, gloves. <laughs> <laughs> Me P is taking it one step, but he he's talking pooping out of his saddle and oh it was oh, it went nowhere fast. It was a good one though. Uh, <laughs> all right Tim, I'd love to hear uh any kind of story or situation that was a bit of a light bulb aha moment for you. Yeah, I was you know with your question I was thinking about it's with me, it's not, it wasn't just like one thing. It was more of a kind of like an evol evolution of years of hunting. Um, I'll start with like, so in 2015, I was after, um, and this was, this was an Oneida County. So it's North central Wisconsin. Um, this is back. Uh, I baited back then cause you could, um, and, the, and I was hunting with a group of guys and everybody baited. So everybody kind of had their own placement whatnot but i was after this 10 pointer and uh on november 1st i actually saw him and he didn't present me a really good shot it was more of a frontal type thing and i was shooting mechanicals at the time and i was kind of like really unsure of like well can i penetrate can i actually make that shot so i was really 
kind of like hesitant and then he eventually picked me off so following so the following year i was like okay i hope that buck made it and that was 2016 and he did and he and he grew a little bigger and he was you know just a, just a stud for a northwoods deer and then um i was getting them on early early season camera and i had uh same area probably a few hundred yards difference of the setup um i was really specific on my setup i was really specific on how i walked in you know stuff like that um i hunted 10 times in that same stand um in a row and i didn't see one deer and then I think on my 11 sit, I saw this like seven pointer come in and he wasn't, it wasn't a 10, but I, I let her rip and I didn't hold back. Right. And oh, I, yeah. and I still, and I still remember like thinking to myself, like, why did you do that? Like, I wasn't like excited. I was more like kind of, you know, cause that's where like uh, buck shame in social media was kind of becoming a, a big thing back then. And, um, uh, so I kind of was like, man, I should have just held out. I, it was October 24th. It was still early. I should have passed him, but I didn't. I just, you know, tr trigger finger got a little happy and just let her rip. Right. So he was a, he was a good buck. Um, I, you know, I, it was a learning moment. It was a, at that point I was kind of like, okay, maybe we'll try something bigger. Following year 2017, um, I lost that area where I'd been hunting. So hunting with another buddy in, in really big woods where it's thousands of acres and uh uh we were spread out it was like pr we probably picked like a, a 2000 acre trek you know that was what we picked um we did some scouting we put out some trail cameras and we didn't really know what to expect we walked two and a, two and a half three miles sometimes back and so that was a stuff that was a little beyond like what we were used to um, November 1st, again, I saw the biggest buck up at to that point that I'd ever seen. Um, and I think I've, sh I've shared pictures with both of you guys, um, that buck, um, and I nicknamed him Rome, Rome. and I saw him at, and he was like, he was like 70 yards out and he was, he was making this, he was over right in front of my camera, taking these beautiful pictures and he was just working a scrape. And then that buck, he didn't walk down the trail that I was hoping he would, where I was set up on and he walked his own trail and i think that was the turning point in my big buck kind of like um ventures where i was gonna like try for really something big because the way i seen him move was not like not like any other deer i'd seen move they, those big bucks they move differently through the woods through the timber um they, they move with a purpose and he had his own trail he had his own you know idea of what he was doing and so and I thought that was quite fascinating how he looked so, so different than any other deer at that point that I had seen. Um, so, so I think I started gravitating to learn more about um, big buck behavior and mature bucks and how to kind of target them. Um, and then at that point, that was when I started like going to social media or going to forums. And that's, you know, and that's where I found the hunting beast. And a lot of my, my strategy comes from that. I was really glad you brought up Rome because that's a buck you've shared with us and your journey. And um, that was one I was hoping you would talk about. And I think the point you brought up was great just about what he did when you saw him and not mm -hmm. using the big main trail. And I just thinking back to when you said that just because here in Wisconsin, I think one of our biggest disadvantages is just not being able to see very far in the woods. I mean, everywhere we hunt is really densely foliage you, you can't see far you can see 60 yeah. 70 yards so i think we miss a lot of opportunity to visually see what these deer are doing but i'm just thinking back to trail cameras and Corey, i'd love to know your perspective not just to verify what tim said but like honestly if you think back to it i've got a lot of pictures of bucks that are either coming into a mock scrape <clears throat> or coming across trail crossings they might be on a trail but when you see them leave like in video mode or even in pictures they are not always on those trails. They're checking those trails, but I've had num a number of times when the bigger bucks, like fully mature, are not using them, but they're cutting across them some way, but they're not walking down them like every other deer you're getting pictures of. And I think that little point that you just made is a really good one about how mature deer are using the woods differently than every other deer. I think it depends on time of year. Um, like that big one I've been hunting the last two years, uh, you know, early on in the season, September, October, when I get 
videos of him coming into mock scrapes, you know, he's using the trails then. And, uh, you know, that, that makes sense. But then the two times that I did see him bow hunting last year, you know, that was more late. It was late October one time and the other time was during a rut. And, you know, that time of year, he's going from point A to point B across country. And, you know, there's nothing, nothing stopping him. So he's, he's getting where he wants to go the quickest, the quickest way. I think back to even sometimes I spend a lot of time in the woodshed hunting and sometimes it's different time of year. Like Corey just mentioned, because in the winter, they're obviously looking for feed and browse, but sometimes we're, I'll find these antlers is nowhere near any sort of deer trail. Now, if you're out in a clear cut, that makes sense. But if you're in a heavily wooded area where there's deer trails that are prevalent, I found antlers that have been 30 to 40 yards from any trail, any visible trail that makes you just wonder like, was there some kind of pressure? What's going on? Was he just browsing? But I think that's a really interesting takeaway, Tim, that they, these bucks are using the woods very differently in some instances than what the other deer are using. Um, yeah. You guys ever notice like buck rubs, you know, you'd be walking on a runway and, you know, the buck rub is never right on the runway. It's always, you know, 10, 20 feet off to this yeah. one together. It's like parallel to it a lot of the time. Um, I think, you know, we, so when we talk about this with mature animals and in, in different trails, there's, there's fewer of the mature animals and they, if they're walking their own trails, those trails aren't going to be beat down. They're not going to be as noticeable as the, the one that all the other deer are taking, you know? So the trail may be there. We just can't see it because, because, because he can see it because he's walked it, you know, a thousand times but we can't see it because it's just him walking it. Um, and with, you know, especially in that, and that's mostly with big woods, I would say um, it is a little, it gets a little bit different when you're hunting, you know, it's like egg country. Um, uh, I think hill country is probably a little more predictable as far as like big woods or, or big deer tra traveling. Um, Cause it, it's, you know, it's hard walking and those, those animals, man, they walk through that, that country like nothing. Like it's just a down the street, you know, it's so, it's so effortless watching those deer move through those hills. It's, it's, it's quite amazing actually. Now, Tim, like I'd like of, to ask you, oh, sorry, Corey, go ahead. I was going to say like one of the strategies I use, you know, where you say the buck doesn't always travel the runway. You just got to keep following that runway till you get to, you know, some blowdowns or, you know, a real thick spot where it's so, you know, brushy that it pinches down that, you know, that's where he's got to move through is on that runway. That's where you uh, throw your camera, the mock scrape and, you know, see what kind of deer are moving through the area. Yeah. Good pinch. I had I a, even, a but, sorry, go you ahead. know, lead, leading up to spots like that, you know, like I said, I'm trying to, you know, get him in front of a camera on a mock scrape, you know, if there's any kind of big logs or blowdowns or tops, you know, anything that I can, you know, lift and drag, I'll, you know, drag a bunch of brush in there and, you know, try and funnel them deer, you know, in front of a camera block off trails that are maybe skirting behind and whatnot i think yeah. i did that last week yeah that's a good tactic especially for getting photos um <clears throat> good tactics for areas that you know pretty well and have scouted locating these you know subtle buck trails both of you have hunted out of state Corey, you hunted iowa i think that was your most recent out of state it could be wrong yeah that's my only out of state so far um as far as your experience with going out of state what what little ahas or what little things that had helped you maybe on a new property or a property you've just e-scouted have you had anything that like well i'm never going to waste my time doing that again or have you had any moments that maybe helped make that process easier because if you've got five days, six days, maybe seven days. That's not a lot of time. And you guys both know when you get, you walk there and your boots step out of the truck and hit the ground, that clock is burning. And in the back of my mind, that clock is always ticking. And whatever I can do to maximize my efficiency, whether that's scouting or balancing the scouting and hunting, like, you know, you got to scout, but damn, you want to be in a tree. What have you guys come up with or seen or heard of that maybe would help somebody with that? I'll let Tim go first. He shot a buck. I didn't. <laughs> it's gradually work. Damn nice one. Um, yeah. So with hunting in a handful of states and uh, actually going on the road with with uh, Danny Infault and um, 
being in the same camp as uh, THP. Uh, I did learn a, a bunch, just, just the logistics of, you know, just camp and how to balance your time from the woods to, you know, back at camp, um, which, I, which I feel was really beneficial. Um, driving around is important. If you're out of state and you've never been there, um, you got to know, you got to know which areas you can hunt, but you also want to see who's hunting where. So you kind of have to take a quick drive around, right? Um, just to see what kind of pressures in the area. Um, if you've had your, you know, certain spots picked out, you know, see if somebody's already been in there. The, the buck I killed in Iowa, I checked that parking lot like three times before I even, even hunted in there. So I think, you know, that was a, that was a good takeaway. Um, to start was there people there when you checked did you see trucks no there was there was truck tracks there but there wasn't anybody there and that and i mean in that season we were getting a lot of rain um and Corey knows because i think a lot of his spots were flooded out and he couldn't get to um yeah, there's so. a couple spots i wanted to hunt and you know iowa there's there's no bottom in them rivers it's all that silt that washes yeah. off the fields and you know even the water you know in the summertime the water would be six inches deep you'd step in there and you just sink up to your hips and silt and you couldn't get across them right right so i mean that's that'd be the first thing i'd do is you know just get a get your bearings figure out where where to go then you know like you said the balance of scouting hunting and that clock is always but you you have to scout you can't you can't just kind of just wing it and just walk in the woods and set up i mean you can but you're not going to feel very confident. You're not going to feel like you're in the game, right? So you do have to move around. And I guess in a lot of my philosophy on the road is what I do back home is I'm moving every single hunt. I'm almost hunting in a new spot. I'm always moving around, right? That's kind of like the idea where first sit came, you know, that it's like I feel in my opinion, in, in, in my experience, I think the first first time you're in a tree is probably your best opportunity maybe to catch one off guard right 100 um, percent. that that's just my opinion um there's maybe some other guys that disagree but that's just in my experience i've seen more deer i've seen bigger deer um um and uh you know i've been more successful by doing it too so um so moving around even if you're even seeing deer a lot of the time Set, uh, adjust your setups, right? Like if you're, you know, when I was in Iowa, um, I, I would move from tree to tree almost, you know, on a daily basis. I thought, I thought that was really helpful. And, and guys even pointed it out to me. I didn't even know, I didn't, you know, maybe at the time I didn't know what I was doing. Um, Cause when you're, when you're in the middle of it and you're by yourself and you're doing, going through it, you know, you're, you're missing a lot of what you're, 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 you're processing. So um, so guys were saying, yeah, you were even seeing bucks and you were still moving. It's like, yeah because i just wasn't <laughs> i wasn't seeing what i wanted to i wasn't you know the 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 right one didn't walk by yet so you guys got to keep on moving um it's and then other stuff for like out of state um you, i think sometimes you have to learn to take a break um and if that means taking a break uh, from hunting and just do some scouting and doing some walk around, I think that's important because if you're not feeling like you're in the game or your confidence is starting to swagger, um, I think I think it's, it's good to kind of change it up and maybe just walk around a little bit or maybe just maybe sleep in a, like an extra hour early in the morning and then go and get some coffee. Um, I think that makes a difference. I really do. You got to recharge your batteries. You can't just pound pound it 100 all the time because you'll just you'll even you're you'll eventually you know your mind will give up or your body will so i'll piggyback off that and i've never been able to do a real a long extended hunt of like seven eight nine days just with work and teaching and but even if it's four or five days if you start getting burned out a hot breakfast and a cup of coffee at a little diner will recharge your batteries. And by the time you put your coffee cup down, you will be rearing to go probably go to the bathroom first, but you'll be yeah. rearing to get back in the woods. Cause a good hot breakfast after you've just been eating crap or gas station food or rolled up or tortillas with peanut butter in them. Like, yeah, like th that really yeah. does recharge your batteries. It fires you up and it all it takes is 45 minutes. Maybe, you know, go have a right. breakfast. That's a great tip. I like that. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, because when, when I shot my Iowa buck, actually, um, I slept in that morning and I did it intentionally because I'd been hunting hard for four days straight. And I, the, the day before already had spent 12 hours in a tree and I didn't know what to do. And I was, and I even remember talking to you guys, you guys helped pick me up. And it's like, but that morning I slept in and I actually went and got gas, got coffee, got a breakfast sandwich instead of just hit the woods right away. And then I just went scouting. And it, it did help my mental state, I felt. Heck yeah. I think I, you know, I think when I was in Iowa, I, you, know, you said keep moving. I, I think I moved too much. You know, Johnny and I went down there and we scouted in uh, 2018. And then we went back down there again in 2021. And, I mean, we had so many spots scouted out. And, you know, there's a lot of good looking stuff in Iowa. And I tried to pack too many places into, you know, one week and a la half long hunt while I was down there. I should have just stuck to two or three properties because there were some spots, you know, I was driving two hours midday to get from one spot to the other because we had, you know, so many spots marked. I feel like I'm a little bit like you, Corey, where I do the same thing. Like if you look at my out of state spots right now, the number of different places that I have pins dropped that are like, oh, must go spots. There's just way too many of them. And I've done that before, especially on my Illinois trips where there's so many good looking spots that in the back of my mind, I know I'll kick myself in the butt if I don't go there. So I go there, mm -hmm. but then you're getting just these small little blips of Intel. Like, well, I saw a little bit, but I didn't see a lot, but you didn't really walk that much. Cause you're so worried about, oh, I didn't see anything. Got to go to the next spot. Whereas maybe picking, like okay. you said, pick the spot. You think you got the best opportunity for the time of year you're there. And if the sign looks good, good enough for you to hunt there, throw a couple hunts at it. Throw at least two hunts, a morning and an evening or whatever, and really make it your effort to get the most intel as you can. It's like when I got to Iowa, you know, Johnny, we had, you know, just so many spots scouted out across, I don't know how many counties it was. And the first thing I did to Iowa, when I got to Iowa was went and scouted a different spot that we had never been to before that, you know, was <laughs> on my mind, but we just ran out of time and, I think that might've been my best spot that I should have just focused on that area. Cause, uh, the first, you know, I, I scouted it in the afternoon. I got there and, you know, almost got in a fight with a buck on a water hole there and went in there the next day and seen a really nice buck. And, uh, I think I saw, I think I saw 10 or 11 bucks that day, but then the next Pretty day good. the wind, was, yeah. And then the next day the wind was bad and I, you know, jumped over some different spots and looking at the app and remembering all these, you know, great locations he had and, started bouncing around and kind of forgot about that spot and, you know and then i circled back in there four or five days later and got in there and here's somebody put a hang on stand up about 60 yards from where i was sitting so i got a little pressure i should, I should have just stuck with that area and just you know hunted it a couple days in a row instead of you know chasing pins on a map like i like i was <clears throat> that kind of that mental game and making those decisions reminds me a little bit of like the chasing a picture when you use a trail camera, right? Where you have yep. like in the back of your mind, it's that pin, that other place. Oh, well, I did get that buck on this camera. How do you guys manage that? I mean, Tim, I don't know how many cameras you're running, but I know Corey runs a fair amount. Do you guys find yourself chasing pictures? Is the camera thing an issue for you guys? Or is that not really a deciding factor on where you're hunting here in Wisconsin? I'll let Corey answer that because he's got more cameras than I do. I used to chase pictures, but you know, once you get the picture of the buck, um, you know, he's been there and he's gone. Cause you know, I, we don't hunt big woods, but it's, you know, the areas that I hunt are big chunks of timber. If you factor in, you know, all the private land, public land, you know, it's 50, 50 per, uh, between big timber and farm fields. You know, if I get a picture of a buck, you know, it's nice to see he's not, he's in the area. I mean, I'm not going to, I mean, if it's the rut, you might, you know, jump back in there and, see him the next day but you know if i go like you know two two weeks or so and i haven't got a picture of that buck it's like well maybe i better go hunt there because he's due for an appearance because he hasn't been there yet so i you know i try and kind of move ahead of him and you know pick a weather front that's coming in or something that's going to get them deer up and moving and go in there and hunt uh and try and get him the next time he shows up to a scrape Tim, when you were getting pictures of your big boy Rome and whatnot, and I know that's not cell camera or anything like that, but did that play into your mind when you got, you know, one of the biggest deer of your life? Was that 
playing head games with you? Would how would you do with that information? I chase pictures. That's <laughs> I you know back in you know and looking back, that's something you you can learn from. And when you because you, you're you know especially when we're we're doing cell cam back then, everything is could be a day or two late. Um, but sometimes you'd be like, okay, well, he came through two days ago. I'm going to hunt here now. Hopefully, like, like Corey said, maybe I'll be ahead of him and he comes around again. Um, or maybe there's another one in the, you know, cause sometimes you, you'll get several bucks on, on just one camera. It's not just, but you know, obviously when I was after Rome, it was like, he's, you know, he was the one I was really wanting, but there were other bucks I would have shot. So it was like, yeah, you, a lot of the time I was chasing pictures. Um, these days I, I try not to do that as much. Um, I like to, you know, I put out my cameras and, um, aside from my cell cams, I try to almost forget about the other ones. Um, if I'm in the area, I'll, I'll check them, but I don't intentionally make specific trips to go and check the non cell. Um, I'll check those when it's convenient or I'll pull them at after season. And then I'll try to use that, that data to my benefit the next, the following year. Um, cause you know, after you work with cameras and you you uh, catalog all those picks, you kind of understand that deer are going to be in a certain area and, and using a certain terrain um, at certain times, you know. And whether it's the same deer or if it's going to be other bigger deer, because they'll do they'll, they'll do things they'll repeat that behavior eventually. So you kind of always keep that in mind. So, um, but with cell cams, yeah, sometimes it is a little bit of a chase. Right. It, it, but it's not necessarily, you're not hunting right over a camera. You're hunting an area like, okay, I know this buck's in this area. Where do you think he went? Where, you know, what is he, what is he doing? Um, and where can I potentially move to? And then you start sort of like grid hunting, I suppose is how you could do it is you, you hunt one spot. Okay. He wasn't here. And then you, you adjust and you, you know, and you keep moving and you could either bump into them or you don't. That's just, I mean, that that's the game you play with being mobile, right? Um, but you know, then you have that weighing on your mind, like back at the camera. Should I have just been sitting there? Because then when he shows up at that camera and you're not there, <laughs> you're like, what the, you know, you're like, I should have been there, you know? So, so that's, yeah, that's a, a big challenge with the mental game. But with, having experience chasing pictures i've tried to just dial it back and just just read the woods and hunt what i'm seeing and trust my scouting that i did in this previous spring so i think i think you you took my idea that i was thinking right out of my my mind and Corey mentioned earlier with the woodsmanship and Corey was able to grow up in a hunting family where he learned woodsmanship early. And when you have that woodsmanship aspect and you understand how animals are using the land, that idea of grid hunting off of your camera pictures is a really interesting one. Cause when you first think about grid searching an area, you're searching everything. But if you've done your homework and you've done your scouting, that grid gets smaller real quick. And all of a sudden you might go, okay, he's coming from this way. There are three areas that I think he's coming from. So instead of that grid being boxes with 20 boxes in it, now you might have an idea if you did your homework, that he's probably coming from one of these three areas. Let me work my way around it without messing up this area he already likes where my camera is. That, yeah. that was very well said, Tim. I think that was a good, really good point. I like that. Yeah. I like that a lot. And, and, and one thing I think we think about, we forget about is, and, you know, like during the rut, we're not just thinking about just one deer or a, a few big deer. We're thinking about where are the does, you know, where are they congregating? Where are they hanging out? So if you, you know where they are, most likely certain times of year, you can head to those areas too and use that to your advantage. And hopefully there's something going to be moving around looking, you know, checking those areas. Um, you know, it's not, it's not exact science because it's hunting, right? We know that, but um but you, when you do it enough and you start to see these patterns and you see these tendencies, you start to be able to predict a little bit and guess a little better. Yeah, absolutely. We're coming up on an hour here. I appreciate your guys' time. I had told you it was going to be 30 to 40 minutes. I anticipated it might go longer just because I was hoping it would. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't want to keep you guys too much longer. I do have one last question for you, and it's okay if you don't have a good answer for it. But uh, any goals you guys have for this upcoming season? I mean, we're all getting excited. Season's right around the corner. Anybody have any goals? Any any things you're looking forward to that you'd like to share? 
I think I know Corey's. He's probably going to be wanting that that big one that he was after. I think uh, gonna... I'm not taking pictures this year. <laughs> I'm <laughs> I'm shooting the first nice buck that walks by. I keep saying that every year. <laughs> That's always my goal. <laughs> so you Let's should go. Do. That's you talk. You take pictures where you know you get a picture of a buck, you know, in the morning or in the evening, and then you jump right in there the next opportunity and chase the picture. You know, I need to quit chasing the the pictures of that one buck and shoot the nice one that walks by that make me happy instead of chasing the pictures of the big one. Dick, that Dick, I, what you just gotta remember. Yeah. Then I can get out of state. Miss that. Try some new what the woods gives you, you know. I mean. Yeah. I mean, if you got, you know, this 110 inch beautiful buck ready to be shot, let her rip. <laughs> and let yourself be happy, right? Like, don't yeah. hold some stupid standard over your own head or worry about let your that's what we're there for. Enjoy the freaking animals, enjoy the hunt. Yeah. So you shoot that first 100 inch deer, Corey. I'm rooting for you. <laughs> the kids want me to bring home a, you know, a buck to hold on to. They're, they're sick of looking at pictures. <laughs> pictures just don't taste as good <laughs> they, they just don't like you know trail cam pictures as much as i do they want to put their hands on something yeah. uh, tim anything for you um yeah i got a couple goals and um i guess now that you i have to say them out loud here so i guess they're going to become real but um i'd like to shoot a wisconsin buck bigger than i did last year um because i shot an, an okay buck and i was i was actually really happy with one i shot last year but i you know that was a of, real nice buck i wanted to hold out maybe a little bit and maybe something a, a little bit bigger than that and then i also want to shoot um um a decent buck in uh, indiana because i'm gonna go there again so um if you know if i can accomplish one of those that would be great if i do both it would be like a dream season at this point so um a lot of my friends in the in the past few years have had dream seasons. So, um, Derek, I know you had your dream season already. I think. Uh, so I just, I, you know, one of, one of the one of these one of these years is going to be mine. One of these years is going to be Corey's. So, well, we're we're rooting for for all for all of you guys. We're rooting for both of you this season. Um, Indiana, I know you were you were getting on some good bucks last year. So I think, yeah, I think this could be your year in Indiana for sure. Yeah, I was I was getting close. I mean, I was just just out of the game, um, you know, during uh, my November hunt, and then I was I was really close late season. So I was like twelve minutes close, like you know, because twelve minutes too dark. He was he walked underneath me a little bit early. So otherwise, I would have let her let her rip, and he would have been a ten yard chip shot. It would have been nice. Well, this is the season to make it happen, boys. Uh, I appreciate your time. It's almost 10 o'clock. I appreciate you guys hanging out with me and jumping on this new segment of the podcast. So thank you very much. Um, folks, if you have not already, um, first sit on YouTube. Tim's got some great videos there encompassing pretty much everything of all deer season. He's got all kinds of great scouting videos, um, some hunts on there. Go check out first sit, give him some love. And for sure, check out Tenacious Hunter, Corey's channel there. He's got a ton of videos uh, and some amazing turkey footage that doesn't get enough love. Give the turkey gonna, footage some love. I was going to add in, you got to check out the uh, Stillwater Outdoors because Nathan's been editing videos for me and that's where all the turkey videos are at. Yes, yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that. That's a new partnership that just formed this past year, I believe. Um, Nathan's very in North, northern Wisconsin. Yeah, very, yeah, I'm very thankful for that. You know, I, I just don't have the time to edit, you know, like I used to and I'm very picky when it comes to editing. It's got to be perfect. And, uh, you know, I've always loved Nathan's videos and even, you know, sending him my turkey footage. I was real nervous because, you know, I'm so, uh, you know, precise when it comes to editing and he knocked it out of the park. So I got, I got nothing to worry about from, you know, here on out and Nathan editing videos because he does a great job. Yeah, that's great. Go check out all the hard work that's gone into that. I know what it takes to edit a single video, and both of you guys do a really nice job at storytelling on there. So thanks for joining me tonight. Hopefully uh, our listeners found some value in the tomfoolery we talked about. You guys dropped some good insight. So uh, thanks a lot, and uh, we'll keep up in the group chat. Keep sending some great trail cam pictures since I don't get any, gentlemen. All right, guys, have a good night. Thanks for joining us. Gentlemen, hey, you, you can stay on for just a minute. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Tim.